Hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Liv Sibony. I am the head of impact investment at Angel Investment Network. Um, so um, it was really surprising actually, General Assembly, well maybe not so surprising, General Assembly um, came to us and asked us to deliver um, a session around sort of getting from idea to investment um, and um, over the 15 years of um, Angel Investments existence there have been countless a number of people who've come to us thinking they need investment when actually it's not always the thing you necessarily need, need at that stage. And so we thought it would be a really good time to help sort of um, demystify that with anyone who is um, part of the startup journey, either because you're thinking of um, starting a business or you're in the early start stages of um, launching your business. And you know that is the number one question people uh, tend to have is how am I going to get money? So um, evidently it's a question which is big on a lot of people's minds. Um, so I'm going to do the first part of the talk and my purpose is actually to convince you to not get investment for as long as you possibly can um, until a point where it makes sense for you to go to investment if that is the right thing for your business. Um, so <clears throat> before we start, I wish I'd done this before launching my startup, which I'll give you a bit more of an introduction um, about in a, mi in a minute. Um, but um, if you're thinking of whatever business idea you have, think of why you're doing this. Like, why are you actually starting this business in terms of your vision of what that means for the business and where you want to take it and how you're going to change the world through your business? And very importantly, where are you sitting in that vision of the future um, in five years' time? What kind of business do you actually want to be running? Do you want to run, do you want to run, do you want to have the next unicorn, the next Facebook, the next Airbnb, whatever it is? That's totally fine. That requires a complete lifestyle change, um, giving absolutely everything up for the next however many years um, and going on an extremely risky journey of you know make it or break it so that is one journey you could be prepared to have versus a journey of thinking actually um, it's a business I just love to have as part of my everyday life and I never really want to kind of um, change the pace I just want to constantly do it all of the time and more of a lifestyle business that just kind of um, enables you to have a life along the way that's also totally fine, but it's extremely important to think where you sit in that vision of um, the business that you want to build. So I'm literally going to ask you to just take 10 seconds, close your eyes, and try and imagine yourself in five years' time in that business. What, what is your life going to be? What part are you going to play in? What will be the next stage? So, Cool, great. Hopefully it's a rosy one, uh, whichever one you've chosen. So just a little bit about bit of background about me. Um, I joined Angel Investment Network a year ago. Prior to that, I was an entrepreneur. I launched a business called Grub Club, which I ran for five years and then sold to our US competitor just over a year ago. Um, I came from a really corporate background, mass organizations like government organizations, Goldman Sachs, BP, all of that. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because I spent, you know, all my career until becoming a, an entrepreneur as, you know, in really big organizations where processes are really important, rigor is really important, you're measuring your risk and kind of, you know, being as risk-free as you possibly can. And all of that is totally fine. And that works for a really big organization. But I was completely institutionalized. And when I then left my career at Goldman Sachs in order to um, co-found my business, I found that I did everything completely wrong. So I just sat down and started building all of these processes and trying to kind of implement all of this rigor around everything. And that is the worst thing I could have possibly done when I first started my business. Something you want to do later on. At the beginning of the business, you actually literally just want to throw everything out there and just test everything. And everything you may have learned in a corporate background, if that's the background you came from, 
is not what you want to be doing in a startup. It is exactly the opposite. Probably same applies if you've done an MBA. The theory is really, really different to the practice. So first things first is really when you're at that very early stage of your business, um, think of it as a mirror image. So the first part of your journey, you kind of want to do everything you would not do at the later stage of your journey. So it's a little bit like a blurry image, blurry Im mirror image of what you would do at the next stage of your journey. So what do I mean by that? Quite simply, literally, don't start as you mean to carry on. So Grub Club, for example, was a platform to connect um, talented chefs with underused spaces in order to provide unique dining experiences all around the city. Um, uh, my husband was the very first chef on the platform. Uh, my friends and I were all of the attendees for a whole number of different events. We literally played every single part in the role of the journey. You know, my friends were renting out their spaces in order to test it out. We literally got into the detail of everything. You do everything manually. You speak to every single customer. You try and understand all the perspectives of all the different users who are involved in your stage of the journey. You say yes to everything which is kind of exactly the opposite of what you want to be doing later. When you're at the stage of the journey where you're pretty kind of settled with what you're doing, no is probably your main answer that you want to be aiming for. Not at the beginning. Say yes to everything. Do everything manually. Get under the skin of it. Just do it all so you can really, really understand what it's like to um, be involved in every single stage of the process. That's how you understand where the, where the bits can break down and you know how your users interact with the journey, with the um, platform or whatever product it is that you're, that you're building. Um, so the first thing you want to know is you might have an awesome idea for a product. Is it actually a product that people need and that people really love? Again, just take your time at the beginning to speak to your customers, to get feedback from them and really just, and, and just op try and be as open as possible to people telling you, g give them the space for them to say no to you and to tell you why they don't like your product. Because that is so helpful when you have that amazing advantage of having that face-to-face -face or some kind of direct feedback that is when you're going to learn most from anything, in particular if you're trying to develop any kind of platform. What happens later on is people still won't like your product, it's just that they're going to, going to go onto your website, they're going to not like it, and then they're going to leave immediately, and you're never going to know why they're going to leave. So use that early um, opportunity to really make sure you've got something that people love and that is in some way useful to the world, hopefully. Um, so, um, talking about your customers and, and getting, getting feedback, um, you actually want to think of your customer journey as a um, curve, um, like a camel hump, <laughs> um, and, and focus on different segments of customers. So at the very beginning, you want those kind of people who, when the first iPhones came out, they were sleeping outside uh, the Apple store for three days with their tents and just desperate to get out there and try out the new product. These, these, um, it, these are innovators and they're people who really are up for trying something new. So you essentially want to preach to the converted rather than trying to change the mindset of people later on. Because those are the people who are really going to be open to risk, be really thrilled by engaging in something new and again give you that extremely invaluable feedback that you need at the very beginning. So just focus on a really, really small circle of trust of people who are going to test out your product. Then you slow, once you're happy with that, then you slowly, slowly start moving it out a little bit more. But all of this can be done with basically no funding, it is just a whole bunch of manual work, which you can do even outside of your job, just taking the time to do it um, without having to find any investment yet. Um, 
Another trick that we did is no one's got any money for advertising at the beginning. Um, just hack it. So we used to do a whole bunch of slightly wacky stunts so that we could get listed in some great publications. And that is really what was so critical in being able to just get our name out there, get brand confidence, um, get more customers to, to sign up and really punch way above our weights, if I'm honest. Um, so anything that is that you think the press might find interesting, and again, it's a little bit like the product that you think is amazing and customers might not feel the same way, think about the press. So not everything is press worthy. Think about how much uninteresting stuff there is in the press. Make a genuinely newsworthy story that people are somewhat going to be interested in. And again, just think of it from your customer's perspective or from a reader's perspective, what would you like to read in the news that you would find interesting? So, you know, either create a PR stunt like we used to do, or you can, um, you know, read articles related to the topic that you're reading, that you're um, working on, and then provide comments to the journalists. You know, it could be about the doom and gloom of um, the property market. You could then come back and comment saying, yes, I know it's really depressing, but actually there's this really amazing social housing app that I've created that's enabled you to, you know, reduce your bills or something like that. So um, think of cunning ways to get to the press in ways that is going to be make, make it interesting for the journalist to um, publish you. Um, if there's one thing I would say you want to take away from anything I say is um, uh, thinking about what your core KPIs are and focusing on a small number of successes. There is so much noise out there and as I was saying earlier, you want to say yes to everything, but actually it's then about filtering as much as possible and coming out across that no through that noise. So we just focused on a small number of um, stats that was helpful to kind of measure our success. And partly they are stats like what's your repeat customer rate? Because that's really important. You bring your um, customer acquisition costs down if you've got a re good repeat customer rate. But it also means that you've evidently got a decent product that people like um, coming back for. Um, you know, how much do people refer your product to something else? Whatever the relevant KPIs are for your product. We also just threw in there a few emotive ones, like, you know, when we were speaking, when we finally got to the level of um, speaking to investors, we would talk about the number of meals that we've served across London, for example. So throw it, you know, have some element of, you know, sort of emotion and attachment to your product as well as some that are really, really important to just measure whether you're on track or not. And similar to those KPIs, it's just some key successes. So we were listed in this press, or we have X number of five-star ratings, or um, you know, we had this amazing chef who came to do a brilliant event. So just three to five KPIs, three big successes, that's really what you want to have as your North Star. Everything else, just filter it out so that you can really focus on those. And then that is when, once you've really understood what your product is, who your customers are, um, how to make it work, this is when you start um, building your processes and looking at scaling. Um, so now you have the basics in place, this is when you want to start building, well, you always want to be building your personal network, to be honest, from now, all talk to each other tonight. You're all here with similar you know, challenges and questions and you'll find that a challenge that you have, someone else has already experienced and could maybe give you an idea on to, as to how to help solve. The people in the room, you just speaking to each other after the event is one of the most invaluable things that you could possibly do. So before you think of going to networks like Angel Investment Network to come and look for your funding, just build your personal network, go to meetups, attend these kind of events. There's so many um, events happening all over town that you, can, that you can join. At the end of the day, if there's one thing that people invest in, it's the team. So at the very beginning, when essentially all you've got is an idea with maybe a really, really simple 
um, product to show for it, you're not going to convince that many people online in mass to invest in you compared to speaking to someone at an event who happens to be an investor or know an investor or know someone within that circle you get introduced to them and then they'll have more faith in you in knowing you and that is how you get that early money um might be depressing but it's also just practical actionable advice with literally who you know um, so just get out there, talk to as many people as possible, in, in as many circles as possible. When you do speak to people, try and speak in their language. So the, you know, one of the challenges that people often face as an entrepreneur is you get so ingrained in your idea and your product that you start talking in technical jargon about some minor, crazy, funky functionality that you've developed. Just keep remembering, whoever you speak to, just speak in layman's terms, make it really simple, and just imagine yourself in their shoes as someone who'd never, ever been involved in anything that you're doing, and just keep it as simple as possible in order to get their attention and engage them as much as possible. So that's it for stage one. Um, so just in summary, you know, really, do you have a product that people really love? Do you know your customers, um, and do they really do, do they really love your product? Um, what are your core KPIs and successes that you've just got there at the top of your head that you're just going to reel off um, at any possible opportunity? Um, have you built up your personal network and can others explain your product clearly back to you as a check to make sure that you've understood, you've explained it correctly. So that's it from me. Um, I hope that at this stage you, in your, in your journey, um, you'd sort of, I, we would have got you to the point where you feel confident with the product um, and now you would get ready to get your idea to investment stage. So. Over to Ed. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, by way of introduction, could you put your hands up if you are currently thinking about fundraising? Fine, fine, plenty of you. Uh, it's been very difficult for me to give you specific advice because, quite frankly, I don't know what each one of you does. So I want to give you something that is actionable. Um, and I thought about it before I was doing this talk, and I was like, well, why am I doing it? What is, what is my goal? Other than professional integrity and the fact that I'm obliged to stand up and give value, uh, what, what is my reason for doing this? And I thought, I want you to all be better at this process, however that comes across. And if what I explain to you is self-evident and you find it obvious, well, then I'd urge you to go and share that information with other people in the network, in this room. Bring them all up to the standard, because I don't know if any, any of you have noticed, but um, the politicians are making life quite difficult for all of us in the startup ecosystem this week. Uh, so we could all do with a little help, and that starts with us sharing information between each other um, on best practices. So a little background on me. I run a small department uh, at Angel Investment Network, and I've worked there for eight and a half years. Uh, my colleague Sam is in the room with me, um, and we have just perpetually spent our time raising money for startups. Uh, and in the last three years, we've raised about 25 million uh, for well over 150 startups. Here are some of the clients that we've been lucky enough to work with. And I, I count myself privileged that I've been able to work with some, some really amazing entrepreneurs who've taught me as much as hopefully we've taught them about kind of navigating this fundraising uh, environment. So while doing my research, I came across a really interesting article by uh, Jason Cohen, who's the founder of WP Engine. This guy has a business that is doing £100 million annual recurring revenue. Yet, the article he wrote was on behalf of some exercise he'd done at the Capital Foundry, where he'd reviewed 150 businesses. And he said, everyone makes the same classes of error. You're probably making a lot of these errors too. Not that I blame you. After all, these only became clear to me after seeing hundreds of applications. Those who avoided just one of these errors stood out from the crowd. And he's right. He's absolutely right. When we review pictures, just the small amount of attention to detail really makes you, I mean, look how many people are in the room. There's a lot of people just in this room. And so if you're trying to look to win small battles, you, you've got to do everything you can. So hopefully my goal is to sort of take you 
through the journey that, uh, of how we appraise things so you can make those small differences yourself and then when we come to evaluate you, you know, every investor discussion will go better. They'll give you better feedback. If they ask to introduce you to somebody else, they'll do that for you because you've showed the care, attention and detail that it's required. Um, I also I got this, sorry, this email last week uh, and this kind of triggered the basis for the talk and I thought, we started working on this client last Thursday. In 18 hours, we had an offer for 50,000 pounds. Now this is not normal by any stretch of the imagination, but what it told me is that we've managed to condense this process of supplying your information to an investor to them actually being willing to make an offer the best we possibly can. And that's what I want to share with you is the techniques we use to try and kind of engage and tell a good story and get investors who are willing to take a risk on you to, to actually take action. So the good news is obviously the cost of building a startup has come. Anthony from Seed Legals, unapologetically, I've stolen something from one of your blog posts here, uh, which is to say that, you know, if you're in a tech business, the cost has come down. The amount of knowledge available to help you get starting a company has, has skyrocketed. It is just fundamentally easier. Uh, akin to sequencing, which used to cost 2.3 billion to sequence one piece of genetic code or one person's genome, it's now done for $100 and can be done in one hour. That's the good news. The bad news is when the barrier to entry comes down, unfortunately, you, the masses arise and it, it does turn into chaos. And this is a good thing. This is where good ideas come from. Uh, it's very exciting, but to get heard is you know, that much more difficult. So any Jordan Peterson fans in the audience will know that order is often the antidote to chaos. Um, so let's start the journey. You're an entrepreneur. You've come up with this great idea and, and you're pretty sure it's going to be a unicorn. You go out to market and what looks like a unicorn to you unfortunately looks like a bag of hot air to everybody else. Now this isn't a bad thing, it's just it's difficult to get people to buy into your vision. You've been sitting on it for months. To them, they're not so sure. At the end of the day, we love to call people investors. They're not investors, they're people. And people all have their own different biases. And this taps into a point that Liv made. You then have to start working out how to talk to them in a language that's gonna resonate with them. So what happened? The moment you open your mouth, you go from this ball of untapped potential to actually being judged on any hierarchy you can think of. And we do this. It's, if any of you come up and speak to me and you say, I do a B2B cyber tech security company, I just go into my head and think, how many dozens of those have I seen recently? How are they valued? Where was the value statement? Or if you go, I do a food and beverage, how is your revenue then locked into exactly how we'll try and value you based on all the companies we've seen before? It's a pretty precarious situation to be in and actually that first statement is just so important. So think about it really hard. To give you an example, when we're actually evaluating startups to take onto the brokerage, we have this form on the left that we'll take a look at. We then recombine that into like 70 data points and we actually, we term it an x-ray because your pitch deck, you can dress up and make look really nice, but often it's obfuscating bits of the business that are actually critical that go on behind the scenes. So you can't hide from these things. Um, so you need to know how to tell the story that's going to kind of either mitigate for them or, or, or present them positively. What do I say you do about this? So some actionable advice that I urge any of you to do if you haven't already done this is create what we say is a defensibility matrix. So assume your business is doomed. It is going to fail. Nobody wants to invest into it. And you are building a case book for why this is not the case to implore the investor to believe that actually you're somebody worth backing because they are looking at hundreds of businesses. So take your idea in the top left and list anything you can think about the business that you think makes it valuable, right? On the top right, I want you to put things that are specific to your business. I don't care about the market. If it could be the next cryptocurrency or blockchain, you can't just simply state an industry as though people are meant to be grateful for you participating in it. So, Say things that are relevant to your business, your team. Do you have good advisors? Uh, are you making early revenue? Are you, like Liv said, serving loads of meals and people are really engaging with it? What are these tangible things that make you the priority? In the bottom right, then put things about your market that, that you think are important. You know, yeah, it's a hot space. Everybody's going into InsureTech. PropTech's really good this year. Fine. And that story becomes more relevant the more traction you get. So if you are in a great market, then your traction helps us realize that you're realizing the potential in that market. Next, order these. 
so you know what's important and make what we're trying to do here is you're building a story that's separate from your your passion your product it's actually building the investor story and the things and nuggets of information that are important to them so start with your best things on the right and all of those left to right because it's also going to give you visibility about where you've got fundamental weaknesses then what I'd suggest is go on platforms like Angel Investment Network or Cedars or any of the, the high volume startup platforms and go and look at other people's deals and see what st like stands out to you and what impresses you because that's what's going to be impressing an investor. You are asking for people's money. So if you imagine yourself going on those platforms and thinking, why would I part with 50 pounds for this project on Crowdcube? You're in the right frame of mind and with which to judge yourself. So I don't know if anybody knows what, what this is, but this is the Landmark Hotel in London. And we use it as an analogy. Once you've got your framework in place, you can start to sort of engineer the rest of the outcomes of how you're going to get investment. Um, and we use the analogy of a hotel lobby. When you go into the, the atrium of the landmark, you're greeted with this sort of spectacular view. And if you can imagine how bad the rooms would have to be for you to not enjoy your stay after seeing this, like how, how bad would they have to be for you to go, actually, the landmark was a pile of rubbish? This is because it's all about first impressions. First impressions are critical with investors who are looking to, you know, they read pitch decks often for about three minutes. So you don't have much time. And if they don't like it, they won't even read it for three minutes or even for 10 seconds. So what you need to do, and we actually spoke to uh, David Hickson, who's the head of strategy and fundraising at Founders Factory. Um, and he was talking about Daniel Kahneman and system one, this sort of fast and slow, but your emotional processing center. Uh, and you make snap judgments exceptionally quickly. So if you can imagine the flip side of this, a cheap, nasty motel, you're fighting a really uphill battle to get people to have had a positive thing to say about that experience. Next thing we say is once you've sort of opened up the, the emotional processing centers of the, uh, the investors, give them the skeleton key with which to read the rest of your pitch deck because this is context. We go through about 25 to 50 pitch decks a week at least. And the gratitude we have for people who do the work to help us understand what it is that you're doing quickly is, is immeasurable because you lose us. If we have to go four pages to your pitch deck and we think, I don't know what they do. There's just a lot of... Of, of spiel here, a lot of rhetoric, then, then you lose us. We're having to work hard because you couldn't be bothered to do the work yourself. Or think about how you can take the front foot here. You get to set the context and control this experience. So do it and really think about it. And another thing to do here is set a precedent for, for maybe what you want them to read later in the deck. So feed them information. We've got an amazing advisory board. I just think, OK, fine. Well, who is that advisory board? I want to find out. So I'll give it more time. I don't know if anybody can read this, but basically, these are two clients that we saw uh, in the real world. One is called Kin, one is called Kit and Kin, so remarkably similar names. And we've taken the Google explanation here, which is that they do remarkably similar things. So I don't think at this point any of you would know which one you're going to invest into. I mean, you're welcome to, to have a guess, but it would be as good as flipping a coin at this point in time. So you see the effect and confusion caused by just talking about what your business does. Because if we're seeing you en masse with other businesses doing exactly the same thing, nothing stands out. If I just said, oh, you know what, but I work for Kit and Kin, the market's $20 billion, it doesn't change a thing. Nothing's compelling about that story that makes you any different to your competitor. Now, here's what I'm talking about earlier, about pulling these hierarchical points into the structure. Now, Emma Bunton was part of this founding team. They had a £2 million revenue run rate, 17 industry awards, 295 Tesco's listed them, and 477 boots in the first year. Does that change your opinion on which business you'd back? A lot. And that's not to do with your product. That's to do with the investor story being threaded in between it. What would Kin now have to do to make you see that as a viable solution? Another Spice Girl, maybe? I mean, you know, what is it going to do? You get the point. I'm not going to tell you what Kin does because I think that's un unfair. Um, the funny thing is, is, at Angel Investment Network, we understand that actually we're, we're kind of part of the problem. This is something we got the developers to build uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's something you know, I'm immeasurably proud of. Um, and it's the world according to Angel Investment Network, how we see it, which is 112,000 proposals come through our platform every single year. That's a lot. And we have to fight amongst that noise to generate leads as well. So Sam and I are there typing up your proposals for you, working out how we tell that story the best way that we can capture the intention of the 180,000 odd investors on our platform. And it's not easy. But you can see even in countries like Kenya, we've got you know, nearly 2,500 proposals in one year. It's like 
this is really exciting to be part of, but it requires that we're all on our best performance because otherwise you just get lost in the noise. So how do we address this? Well, I think you need to really see this as a series of discrete processes. It's very easy to kind of go in and say, I want to raise investments. And you know what? The analogy here is like a boxer. If you're physically strong, tall, and powerful, maybe you can get a one-punch KO, and you can step into the ring every single time and just swing a big haymaker and knock somebody out. But if you, that's not for everybody. If my business was backed by Mark Zuckerberg, I'm sure people will throw money at me. But I don't think that's the story that I could tell all of you is going to be successful. So break these processes down. And the way we do it is prospect to pitching, pitching to diligence from the investor, diligence and negotiations, and negotiations to close. And then you can understand where certain people are coming into the, the process to try and speed these things up for you. You can then look at the part that you can add value to. So if I'm telling you that Angel Investment Network's making it easier to, to prospect and pitch, how are you going to speed up the diligence process? How are you going to make the negotiation smoother? And then you'll see that Seed Legal's come in to help make negotiations to closing easier. And you're going to hear from Anthony later about how he's doing that. So you can start to optimize these processes because if you can't measure them, you will not be able to optimize them and it will just be a guessing game for you. And good luck to you if that's the case. So some of the things that we also think are just like small tactics that I think are important to sort of deploy and that there are loads of them that we see that are quite clever and I'd be happy to share with anybody afterwards. Um, but sometimes you, you need to see these discrete processes as like, it's almost like an action potential of a nerve and you need to give the energy to the investor to go through to the next process. So always be thinking about just what can I do to get them to the next stage of this process. And sometimes we say, hold back parts of your story. Leave bits and updates and exciting news so that every time you're going and re-engaging with them, it's not, oh, what happened? Why did you drop off? Or are you still interested? It's like, you, you know, we just got listed in another sort of 30 retail stores and there's going to be another 60. Um, investment looks like it's coming along nicely. Are you keen to sort of see the financials? It's not a big ask. You're not asking them to invest. You're asking them to take another action because the momentum's building. That momentum will beget more momentum. Another thing I'd say, and this is pretty much my bread and butter, and I would stress that you use it, is I use Mixmax and DocSend to send investors. So if you take away one thing, this is what I do. It works amazingly. So Mixmax lets me send an email to you. I can see when you read it, how many times you read it, where you read it. You'd be amazed what a statement of intent that is for an investor. If they open your, the email that you sent the pitch deck three times, I know they're keen. They're reading it at midnight. They're probably taking another look when they've got a bit of downtime. If they've not opened it, why are you wasting your time on trying to re-engage with them? Did you get it? Did you get it? Just follow up with the people worth following up with. And that's when we use DocSend. So DocSend allows us to measure and track everything that goes through a pitch deck so I can see which pages are being read, you can see the drop-off rate of the pitch deck. So if you've made a, a bad pitch deck, you can see where it's falling off. So to send it to some people, get a few people to read through it and see what their, their behavior is like, and then you can try and optimize that. So see, these would be some of the analytics that we take a look at when we're trying to work out how to improve the quality of your pitch. That spike there, that's a financial slide. So you can see what investors are looking at. If you then follow up with them, you can say, huh, oh, maybe the numbers are important to him. Maybe I need to address these in an email that make it sound like I've thought of it and thought of his concern before he's even had that concern. FAQs, I really like this in a pitch deck. I think sometimes pitch decks do need to be light, they need to be fun, they need to be engaging, they need to look good. But sometimes it can come at the expense of information you feel needs to be fed in there. At this point in time, I think an FAQ slide or an appendix is really important. It allows you to sort of show, one, you can gather frequently asked questions from the investors you're speaking to and then put them in there so you're actually crowdsourcing the, the questions. And two, you can do thinking on behalf of the investor that shows you're concerned with what they're concerned with and you're also willing to address it such that they give you another, you know, another meeting, another call, whatever it is. These are just, again, some suppliers that are helping that we're seeing that are doing interesting things. One deck, create and share a beautiful one-page investment summary in less than 10 minutes. Seed legals reducing the cost of creating legals and helping you automate it. And pitch room. So these are people who allow you to put your pitch up, audio narrate it, and add video as well. So there are a lot of people, and just Google these things. You can then add in novel techniques that, that an investor hasn't seen before, that may surprise and may think, oh, this guy's really on it. So there's a lot of people trying to help. So what are the takeaways? I'd say identify and separate out key components of your business that will appeal to the investor. 
Arrange these into an ordered hierarchy so you can see where your strengths lie and where you can improve. Pay attention to first impressions and take guidance over that process. And then last, I'd say break it down into specific goals and focus on optimizing each of them. And I was thinking about how to, to end this today, and thankfully, actually, the, the, the guest we had on our podcast uh, did it for me beautifully. The, I think once you've done all of these things and you've actually shown that you have some kind of technical skill in fundraising, then show investors what winning looks like. And this was Kenny, Kenny Ewan from WeFarm, and he said, then you can show the big vision. And he's absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, panelists. Some of them I've seen many times before, and I know that you're, you're in for a treat already. Um, but by way of introduction, uh, starting with you, Liz, can you just tell the audience what your company does uh, and a little bit about you? Here we go. Am I on? OK. Hi. Um, so I'm Liz Swanton, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Feeder. Um, Feeder is revolutionizing the way that we eat at the office. So we build cloud canteens, which is exactly what it sounds like, a virtual canteen that allows people to access healthy, high quality, delicious food that's personalized to them every day at their place of work. Um, we really believe that there is a whole artisan group of amazing vendors out there. So we're a marketplace and we bring you that great food every day in offices. Um, and, and actually just to let you do a humble brag, how much have you raised today? Um, we've raised a little bit over two million uh, pounds to date, yeah, in two rounds. Anthony, I know you've got a very eclectic background, but if you try and summarise it for, for everybody here. Hi, I uh, used to head up BBC iPlayer. After I left the Beeb, I built a startup, sold it, built a startup, sold it, invested in a few, got tired of paying lawyers, and built Seed Legals to change that. So, Seed Legals is a one stop place for everything to do your funding round, to build your team, protect your IP. It's the fastest and easiest way to do a round. We have more than 6,000 companies on Seed Legals doing two funding rounds a day, and we've got the data and team to help you do all of the legal stuff to get invested and grow the company. And Will, who, Will's a, f a former hopefully happy client of mine. So. <laughs> I mean, a bit iffy. Um, <laughs> so I'm Will Harris, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Entail. Entail is a next generation platform for creating and listening to podcasts. We're aiming to make podcasting um, much more visual, much more engaging, much more shareable. And so we like to think of our platform as being kind of podcast for the Instagram generation. Also adding to that that you sold Channel Flip prior ah, to that, so yeah. it's his second time so, round. Yeah, so this is my second startup. My first startup was a company called Channel Flip, which is a YouTube production network where we uh, are famous for doing exciting things like discovering Zoella. If anybody there is a particular fan of, of, of Zoella. Um, and I worked as a um, head of digital for Condé Nast for, for a few years. Okay, so just to kick off, um, I'm going to start with you, Liz. Uh, dealing in the sort of food and beverage space, you obviously had an idea. Um, how did it turn from something you ruminated over and, and you identified this problem to actually sort of formalizing it and bringing it to life? A lot of sweat and tears. Um, no, so I think that there were a few major things along the way that allowed, allowed sort of me to bring this to life. And one was obviously meeting my co-founder, so we definitely went on this journey ourselves. Um, we really went out and uh, started to figure out if there was a need in the market for it. And that was the biggest thing that, that we did is we went out, we talked to vendors, we got that side of the marketplace and we went out and we just tried to pitch it and sell it to customers even before we had much of a product or service. Mm -hmm. And it was really that validation that then took us to the next step that um, we actually started building the tech and um, building really a tech first company. But first we validated the, the idea through figuring out if someone was gonna pay for it. And were there any moments of sort of crushing self-doubt that you had to overcome? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, the food and beverage space is, is really competitive, right? So we look out there and we're really competing with anywhere anyone is, but is getting their lunch at the office. And there's definitely moments of doubt where you say, do we believe that we can compete with huge players out there and established players out there? And I think that each step along the journey that we go helps us and validates the fact that we believe yes, mm -hmm. but certainly it takes, I think, uh, yeah, strong, a strong day to, to stand up and say, you know what, we, we can do this and we're gonna keep doing this and we believe that we have something totally different from what everyone else offers. 
and Anthony bringing numerous sort of figments of your imagination to life. Um, what have you learned as sort of mistakes that you've made that you've, you've managed to eke out each time you've gone and started a new company? I think uh, when you're a developer, as kind of I am, the uh, success is building stuff. But I've learned that success is not building stuff. So actually people, I think the key thing when you're creating a startup, you think that you have to build a lot of stuff. But actually all things you build is a failure to not have to build it. So what you want to do is raise a small amount. You want to do the most validation you can before you build anything. And so too often, I mean, at Seed Legals now, where I talk personally to maybe to five startups a day looking to get to the next step. And they often have an idea and get stuck right in building it. And you talk to someone who's been working on something for six months. Um, but actually, the proof of a startup is that people truly want what you've built. So how can you find that out earlier before you've built it? And again, you think the difficulty is going to be building all this stuff, but actually the difficulty is making people want it. So can you test it up front? And to me, for example, when I hear people tell me about what they're building, it's either people have a problem and I've got a solution for the problem, or it's I perceive the world would be a better place if this was the case. And I think a smile over there, which the ones where you've got a solution to someone's immediate problem is a good uh, indicator of success. And the ones where there's a perceived problem, um, it may be that it's desirable, but it's actually going to be very hard for people to uh, actually want to change their behavior and use what you're doing. I think if I can hop in very quickly on the slide decks, when I started Seed Legals, I wrote to Mike Butcher, the editor at TechCrunch, who I somewhat know, and I said, it would be fantastic, TechCrunch is the right audience, can you write about our, our company? And he said, sounds interesting, send me some info, do not send me a pitch deck. When I say, uh, sorry, a press release. When I say no press release, he wrote an article because he was obsessed about not sending a press release. And so instead he has like 20 questions, and I recommend if you Google Mike Butcher, you know, uh, the press release is dead. So I wrote back to him and saying, Thanks, I'll get back to you after the weekend. It took me about three months to write uh, back to him because I realized all my messaging was wrong. And when I see pitch decks and websites, what people are spending all of their time doing is telling you how clever they are and what they're building. But nobody cares. You need to change it to the problem you're looking to solve. And so my own website wording went from legal document automation and you know, something about contracts, like nobody cares. And then I slimmed it down and now it's basically the fastest way to close a UK funding round. So if investors, so don't make your deck perhaps something that you think is gonna bite on the first page to investors, make it something that the audience will want if they were coming to your website. And the investor will go, oh, this seems like something that people want. I want to be part of it. I don't know if I answered the question. I think so. I think so. Will, my question to you is, you, with Entel, you're solving a problem that is self-evident to solve with a, an industry that's dragging its heels ferociously, which is podcasting is stuck in the dark ages. Um, what frustrations have you faced in trying to change consumer behavior to get them to adopt your product? I mean, absolutely none. It's been really plain sailing from, from day one. Um, no, obviously not. Um, to Anthony's point, okay, this is a really interesting example. So how many people here listen to podcasts? Excellent, okay, keep your, ha keep, okay, no, no, keep your hands up. Uh, put your ha keep your hands up if you listen on the Apple Podcast app. Ooh, interesting, quite a, quite a, quite a big drop off. Uh, put your hands back up again if you listen to podcasts. Hands up if you really like the experience that you've got in the current app that you've got. Yeah, <laughs> so excellent, so almost nobody. So the challenge that we faced was uh, we're building a new app to make it easier and kind of more engaging and, and much more beautiful to, to discover and to use and to listen to podcasts. And we started with this realization that loads of people listen to podcasts, it's a massively growing audience, but nobody likes the experience that they get, right? Self-evident problem. What was very interesting was that because, you know, in terms of how do you face challenges in getting people to move, you know, Apple has a, an iPhone app that does podcasts that's installed on you know, every single iPhone that's shipped globally. And trying to convince people that you can move them away from that is very difficult. 
And what you often face is if you are, you know, particularly when we're talking to investors, investors are often like sort of vociferous uh, consumers of podcasts, right? They're the sort of people that love to be, uh, uh, you know, listening to stuff all the time when they listen on double speed because, you know, they're so busy they have to get through all this stuff. So, you know, be up to speed. I don't know how anybody does that. Um, but you realize that people's, you know, back to the point about investors being people, you realize how much of the investment experience comes down to the individual that you're dealing with. So, for example, we would deal, we, we talk to investors, for example, who are on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. And they go, well, I would never, so we, one of the key things that Intel does is it adds visuals and adds context and links and things to the podcast that you're listening to. So as you're listening, you've kind of got all the information that you want as you're going along. And they say, well, I listen to podcasts in my car when I'm driving to work, so I would never want to interact with my phone whilst I'm listening to podcasts. And so this platform clearly is going nowhere. And you go, right, how many places in the world do people drive to work every day on a sort of 45-minute commute, right, as opposed to being in London where you're on the tube and you've got Wi-Fi everywhere? And they go, oh, yeah. And you realize that, you know, if someone thinks it doesn't apply to them, they make these sort of incredibly broad generalizations. So I would say one of the challenges that we've definitely faced is that idea of, well, if I don't do it, nobody else will do it without realizing that um, there, is, there are hugely different audiences. So one of the ways that we got around that was making really explicit our pitch, which was um, in the nicest possible way, most investors are like 40 year old white middle class men. Um, we made it very clear that Entel is a millennial platform that appeals to an Instagram generation. So if you don't get it, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, so it's sort of turning that kind of weakness or experience into an actual strength. Well, something you also did is uh, putting into your narrative, or you have the license to, is talking about the amount of minutes consumed, because that cannot be contested. Somebody can't say your app's not working, or I wouldn't use it if actually the proof is in the kind of the wild and that. Yeah, and listen, anything that you can back up with data is immensely useful. But I do tend to think that very often when it comes to investors, um, very rarely will you convince an investor of something that they're not predisposed to, to believe, right? You're not gonna change their world by presenting a data point. So it's more about having data that supports sort of almost an existing presupposition. Uh, maybe that's a really uh, pessimistic way of looking at the world. No, you, you're but absolutely I think spot on. Yeah. Well, we sit in the intersection of the investors' opinions on some of your businesses and I can get two emails, one which will say, this is great, I'd love to use this, and the other one that can be like, this is a pile of shit, I hate it, and it's like, completely different opinions and, and you, it's amazing when it's in your inbox and you're just getting all these sort of very, very strong opinions as well. Like, because you're asking for money, they tend to be very decisive in how they want to discuss what they think your idea is worth. Um, Liz, I think a question that probably is relevant to people here is how do you construct a team around this initial vision when you know you need to sort of start putting bums on seats? And did you go out and raise funds to do that or did you find that people would get behind your mission and, and join early and sort of, how did you pull that together? Um, so a bit of both, I guess. We started doing everything ourselves, obviously, um, but also we're not a technical co-founding team. So the first thing we needed to get was someone to help build us the technology. Um, and I think you find people who are really invested in what you're doing and love what you're doing and are willing to work um, you know, for some money and, and, for, and for equity and find people who really are willing to say, you know what, maybe this isn't as much as I can make somewhere else, but I'm really excited about this idea. And you sell them the vision and you take them along on the journey with you. And I think that we started that way, definitely. And the people that work with us now are still the same and that they probably could earn a lot more money somewhere else, but are with us because they're excited and they love what they're doing. So I think you have to sell the vision when you're an early stage startup. I think that that comes no matter what. Um, we also definitely, we raised investment. So first we started up putting um, sort of our own funds in, then we raised a seed round, uh, sorry, pre, sort of pre-seed, and then a second um, sort of larger uh, seed round as well. So for us, we knew that that was the path we wanted to take. I don't think that every startup has to take that path. I think you have to decide and say, this is how we want to build. And we know that we need bums on seats, and we know that we need people in this business, and you need that combination of, of passion, and, and care and love for what you're doing to, to deal with the fact that startups are hard. Um, but uh, we knew that we always needed to build a great team, so we needed to raise to do that. And Anthony, with you, um, in terms of the same question of assembling a team, um, obviously you were a technical co-founder, but um, what's, 
would you say to people looking to sort of offshore technology builds versus trying to get somebody in house who they can sit there and have that discussion with? Like, where do you sit with just getting the technology built quickly and easily versus having your CTO on board? So I'm not a fan of uh, outsourcing. I'm not a fan of offshoring. And the reason is that um, when you know what it is you want, you can maybe write a spec and have someone else build it. But for the most part, you don't know. And there's nothing like having a team that is all invested in the success of the product. All of my team are on Intercom, which we use for our CRM. So when someone pings us and says, this doesn't work, I don't need to write a ticket to our CTO because he's actually seen the thing and he's probably going to ping me going, oh, I've already fixed that. So getting a team together. Now, the problem is, of course, you can't hire people away from their other jobs until you've got enough money to pay them. And so that means, I think, that startups essentially obey a formula. Every idea is different, but the growth formula for an equity startup, and particularly in the UK, is something like this. A couple of people get together, maybe one or two or three, have an idea. An idea is worth zero. You can't get raise money on an idea. So you have to put some money in it yourself and see legal's data over. Thousands of companies say founders put in a median of £26,000 before going to raise investments. And then you may raise a friends and family round of £50,000 or an angel SEIS round of 150000 And our data says you give away 15% equity each time. So startups are all about going from this idea, and I think of it as sort of ripples in a pond. Your goal, you'd like to be out there, but you can't get to several million pounds raised in one step. You have to get there in a few. And by giving away maybe 15%, it means by the third round, the founders still own more than 50% of the company, which is important. And after the third round, you either cash flow positive and you never need to raise again, or you're going to sell the company and exit. So your goal is now to get to the next step and then the next one. And step one is a prototype or an MVP or something that makes you investable, that lets you raise enough money at a high enough valuation that you're giving away the right amount of equity. And I think if you have the money yourself to be able to have £100,000 to hire a team, fantastic. Unfortunately, not everyone does. And so you may need to outsource and use a Ukrainian dev shop and pay £10,000 to get a prototype. But just think of that as really a throwaway to get to the next step, because ultimately the value of the company is the team, perhaps more than the product. I think that's really um, a really key thing that you've hit on, which is that particularly over here, there is a now a really established way that you build from I'm, I'm starting on day one to I'm raising a Series A, right? The, the, the legislation around EIS rules and tax rules and all these kind of things make it a really, certainly the first time I did um, a company, the first startup that I did, we followed almost exactly that formula, but completely by accident, which convinces me that it's completely the right thing um, because it's a data point that I already believe in that's from my previous point. Um, so, um, we, so we see you know, exactly that. You do a, a friends and family, you, know, you start off putting a little bit of your own money and then maybe you get some friends and family, then you can maybe get an angel around it. And at every stage, there are kind of almost set valuation, not quite set valuations, but like, you know, a first angel round is kind of generally worth like 150 grand at a sort of 750 to a million valuation. And all this data is now out there for you guys to get. And this is like, it's such an incredibly underused um, set of data, I think, which is that all the answers are out there in terms of people always say, how much should I be raising? When should I be raising it? How much should I give away? We know all of that now. Um, I will say that my, my, my first business, not this one, but the, f the first one that I started was, was almost exactly that. So we did, co-founder and I um, met and had an idea together. Um, we each saved up enough money so that we could pay our own rent for six months so that we could afford to not work for six months. And then we each took out a 20 grand credit card loan and used that to hire another person each that we were each responsible for. And that was six months worth of money uh, to build an MVP. And that's how we did it. Um, now I've got a question for, actually just as a quick aside, um, not to, to patronize anybody, just to check. Are you all familiar with SEIS? Is there hands up for anybody who doesn't know what it is? You don't, it, it's highly important. Anthony, could you give us a little snapshot on SEIS just for anybody who doesn't know? Yeah, so 
SEIS and EIS fuel the UK early stage startup scene. So the uh, UK government has a very nice tax incentive, which means the company can raise £150,000 where the investors can write off 50% of their income tax for that year. So angel investors, in other words, us individuals who've got some tax to pay, can make an investment in a startup. And not only do they deduct in this tax year half of their investment, but if they keep the shares for three years, and they sell them, they pay no capital gains tax. And if the company goes bang, usually you can't write off your investment, but here you can. And the company can raise 150,000 pounds this way. After that, it's EIS, Enterprise Investment Scheme, and the company can raise another 10 million. And because it massively de-risks the investor's investment, it's essentially putting them all together. It means their risk is about 13 pence in the pound. It means investors will take a punt. But perhaps one thing that most people don't know, and if you ever have investors from the, U from the US or Middle East or somewhere else, you suddenly find that the US, the UK, has amazingly founder-friendly deal terms. Everyone has ordinary shares, whereas if you have a foreign investor, they'd expect to get preference shares, which says on a sale of the company, they get their money back first. Or anti-dilution, which means if you have a down round, you have to give them more shares. And investors can't get this if they're investing and getting their tax deductions. So we're uniquely blessed, I guess. Perhaps 80% of early stage rounds, in other words, raising up to 500,000 pounds, is all about SEIS and EIS. And you should do your SEIS or EIS advance assurance, which, by the way, you can do on seed legals. <laughs> nice, nice plug. Um, Liz, so at some point you got to the point where you were pitching, and you've pitched for numerous rounds um, from some, you know, got some very high profile investors on board. What have you learned through that process with each round of investment of the mistakes you made that you then went on to correct each time you went through? Yeah, so I think a lot of what we learned actually sort of resonates with a lot of what, you, what you've been saying tonight is that ultimately you have to speak in, in the investor's language um, and really be able to communicate your idea in a way which uh, resonates with them. And learning how to do that faster um, allows you to get to more investors who really get your idea faster. And I think that we've learned a lot over the, over the rounds we've raised in how to do that better. And I think that it also, our pitch itself evolved a lot from when we started fundraising in each round until we closed each round. And we have been incredibly lucky to find people who shared our vision um, and to identify them and sell them uh, at a stage when I think our pitch was evolved enough so we had sort of, you know, pitched the first few people, doesn't go that well. You know, you realize actually that the story is not as clear as you think it is and they're just not getting what you're saying and you refine and you iterate and it helps you clarify your own thinking, your own ideas. And that's been really huge for us. And I think that also learning to cut your losses if someone just really doesn't get it. Because mm -hmm. there are people who just look at us and they're like, absolutely not, you're a food delivery company, why would I do that? And there's other people who look at us and say, oh, actually, you're doing something quite different. I mean, forget about the first crowd because you're never going to convince them. And that's OK. You don't need to win everyone. You just need to win your, your investors. And Anthony, a question I have for you is in terms of the amount of money uh, people raise and mistakes they make there, because you know, sometimes, um, as Liv pointed out, actually, you can overcapitalize a company, which sort of almost puts your valuation up quite high. So in terms of startups going out and raising money and, and avoiding the pitfalls of raising too much, or too little, what advice do you have there? So I think my, one of the mistakes I've made in the past is to raise too much. And when you raise too much, then you start building lots of stuff. When you build lots of stuff, you kind of, you think it's building more things as an advantage, but actually building more things is a disadvantage because you can't get rid of the things. Everyone's sort of emotionally vested. So I like, uh, as I've heard with Amazon, that Bezos intentionally starves his team of resources. So they have to think smartly about everything they do. So I think um, don't, one of the common problems is people build things before they've established product market fit. So you really want to try and find that people really want it before you build more of it, which means try to prototype it. I think also, um, sorry, I'll hand over to you. Well, actually, Will, I'll tell you up with a question, don't worry, I've got, I've got you covered. Um, with a B2C model, um, how many people are doing a B2C company? Quite a few. 
Um, how do you stave off this sort of insatiable appetite from investors to sometimes monetize or build in a route to monetization quite early? Because it's, it, it's something that UK, I think, faces a bit of a, an issue with that we, our investors love to push us to revenue early rather than being these big American titans. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I do. Um, it's probably not very popular. Um, the, I, I personally think that there is a, the, the, the Silicon Valley mindset, right, you look at the, com the big B2C companies that we all know, the Snapchats, the Twitters, the Facebooks, they spend years building a product and building an audience before they even think about monetizing it, right? And that audience growth is in itself something that's incredibly valuable. And they can do that in a sense because I think, I, I personally think it's because they have access to huge amounts of capital that come from the fact that people who have already built enormous companies in the West Coast or in the East Coast even, have got the money to be able to fund the next generation of things. And over here, we haven't had quite the same degree of sort of enormous unicorn exits that produce the sort of people that can afford to go and have investment funds of a million or two million funds at a sort of angel basis, right? So I think what tends to happen is that investors tend to be come from a much more traditional world of business over here. And the traditional world of business says you need revenue and you need some degree of gross margin and you need to prove that what you're doing can make some money. Because at the end of the day, we're British and we're kind of pessimistic and we don't, we don't really believe in anything apart from the power of money. So um, getting people to adopt a West Coast mindset of growth is brilliant and engagement is brilliant and you don't need the money is really, really, really hard. And it requires you to either decide that you are going to do it, in which case you are going to get a lot of people that are going to turn you down. You are either going to have to lie about the amount of money that you think you're going to make in a year's time and create a model that creates insane profits by 18 months from the investment date. And that's not a very good answer because you're just going to end up getting uh, hauled over the coals in 18 months' time. Or being very straightforward about saying, look, this is a play where we are growing something from day one and aligning with yourself with investors that also believe that. And there are probably, well, there definitely are far fewer of them over here. But I think unless you really draw a line in the sand that says, look, we're not going to go after revenue in the first two years or in the first three years or however long, we are building the engagement and traction. If you can show that there is a value to that engagement and traction. So if we turned on revenue tomorrow, we could make X amount of money, but we don't want to because we don't want to kill the experience or we're not ready to hire a sales team yet or whatever. Um, then you can, you can do it. But it is, it is um, over here an incredibly hard sell, I would say. Can I hop in? Yes, you can. Yeah, there's just not the same appetite for increased risk. And I think investors, in, particularly in the early stage with SEIS and so on, will take a punt. It's a lifestyle. They love what you're doing and so on, but they'd like to see a return soon. And if they're not seeing the return, at least at the end of the next round, they know that they're getting diluted each round. You're going to use more and more money in the event one day to get to something. And my previous, one of my previous ventures is a social network. And I saw a sort of competitor in the US easy raise many times more, whereas in the UK, there's just not that appetite. So if you have a revenue model, it's dramatically easier to get funding. And I think also by having a more limited uh, ambition in, in terms of the amount of stuff you need to build makes it clear to the investor. They'll be looking at your deck going, we're funding all the stuff. If funding all the stuff just means more stuff needs to be funded afterwards, <laughs> there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But if we build this, you know, we build the podcast app version one. Okay, it's not going to be the full thing, but we'll get some users on it. And then the users, maybe you'll potentially have advertising at that point. You're not going to commit to it yet, but you're not ruling it out to so say, I'm never doing advertising until I hit. Then they know there's no, no exit for them. And you have to then have a very powerful uh, social network, position, gift of the gab, or it's going to take you forever to close your round. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, it's really um, the, the pressure to monetize earlier than you probably would like or probably would be good for the business uh, is kind of cutting off, uh, you know, from an entrepreneurial point of view, I think it's cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, but sometimes if that's the only way you can get money in, then you've, you've got to do it, right, and just deal with the disfigurement. <laughs> um, Liz, a question for you. How 
for anybody listening in the audience, do you go and find your first investors? Where did you go looking for them? Where did you prospect? Um, where did you find them? Angel Investment Network. Not always. <laughs> not always, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd be a much richer man. Yeah. Uh, not for us, unfortunately. Um, but um, so a number of places. So we definitely did go out to Angel Networks. Absolutely. Um, we did a lot of personal networking. Uh, so. Uh, both my co-founder and I um, went to business school, so I went here, London Business School, she went to Harvard Business School. That gave us a really great network to start and really made a big difference in terms of our ability to meet people. And what we discovered is that it's not usually the first person you meet, it's you meet someone and they're like, well, it's a great idea, but actually I really invest in fintech. And they invite you to, someone, to meet someone else. And you keep going through this chain. And I think being really clear that, you know what, talk to the person, talk to whoever it is, and if they're smart and if they're interesting and if they get your idea, even if it's not right for them, they'll introduce you to someone else. And eventually it will be right for the right person. And so I think that networking, reaching out to establish networks and then the ones that we had personally made it. Did you do anything with LinkedIn or cold emailing or anything like that? Some. Um, we tried very hard to get warm introductions, um, which isn't always possible, but again, sometimes took a couple links in the chain to find a warm introduction to someone that, that was the right person. I think that um, yeah, very little sort of cold reach outs. And I think, I think it can work, but it wasn't what we did. I think that a warm introduction goes a long, long way. And, and it was really about taking the time to find those warm introductions, even if it took a while to get there. Um, I think this builds on the point that I say of, of when I said make a good first impression. Um, sometimes there's a lot of ego from some entrepreneurs and they, they dismiss things out of hand or they feel rejected and then they sort of just close the conversation down. But you, you honestly never know where it'll lead on to. So I always think like setting a good impression and asking people if they know anybody is like, it's pretty useful. Um, Anthony, my question to you would be, I guess, the cult of, of sort of well-known high-profile uh, investors or advisors and the value that that brings to early stage companies looking to build a, a fundraising story on the back of that. Um, where do you sit with that? So um, I'm not a huge fan of paying a lot for an advisor. I think people overestimate the value of an advisor, particularly if you're in the blockchain or ICO space, everything's about the advisors. But you know, you can pay 40,000 pounds to a developer who will be part of your team 24 seven and help you sit with you and build the product. Or you can pay some amount to an advisor who will pop up one day a month and give you some advice and then leave and they don't own the problem. So I think you, you, the team has to own the problem and own the solution and advisors don't. Um, sometimes investors will pitch you that I will um, really help you and I'll bring connections and we're in Zurich and we're in Ever. And whenever an investor is sort of telling you that, I'm thinking when I was looking for office space and they tell, they show me the bicycle racks, the bathrooms, I'm going, there's a shitty office somewhere here, maybe the opposite of the Lansdowne Hotel. But, um, but so I think, by the way, if I can go back, the formula to finding an investor for me is the first thing not to do. I find startups really early on going looking for funds and VCs. Why? Because you can open, you know, you can Google them, you can find out who they are, there are lists of them. But the problem is they will only typically invest larger amounts and only when you've got revenue. So the usual story, and you'll see when you try it, is you find a VC, you pitch to them, they go, I love what you're doing. You know, how much are you looking to raise? 300K. Well, our minimum ticket's a bit bigger. Why don't you raise a million? You go, that's amazing. They can invest a million. But then, you have to have a company valuation of at least three million or you're giving away way too much equity. So you come back to them and they go, well, this three million valuation, do you have revenue? And you go, well, no. And they go, well, come back later. So it's an endless sequence of come back later. And instead, the thing I recommend is as follows. Number one, make a 50 word pitch that establishes a problem and how you solve this problem. May mention the magic words looking to raise, offering SEIS and EIS, make a nice little picture of something, and then be completely shameless and share it as widely as you can. Do a Google search, how do I download my LinkedIn contacts? You've probably got a thousand or several thousand. Post it in Facebook groups, and you get an odd amount of networking. Some people go, this is interesting, tell me more. Some people will tell their friends, They'll tell you competitors who you didn't know, which is essential when you go and talk to an investor. So the more you network and the more you spread the word, the more response you'll get. 
And you only need 20 angel investors at 10,000 pounds each to get you well on the way. And that's not that difficult. And then if someone writes back to you, thing two is make a product deck. Product deck, sort of pitch deck, but no financials, not how much you're raising, not your business plan. And you're fine that someone shares that with someone else. There's nothing hugely confidential, but it looks great. It presents well. It says what the problem is, maybe on page 17, how clever you are. But initially, it's a wow. And then if people, and feel free to share that with whoever gets back to you. And then lastly, you've got your more sophisticated, more confidential deck with numbers, which you may then meet up and show people one on one. So it's all about getting the message out as widely as possible. And I think lastly, with one more second, is that investors have no idea whether this is going to be successful or not. So they have to pick up every little data point they can. So you should be spreading things around that all the signals that make this look like it's going to be a winner. So maybe they Google you. They should see news re references. They should see it on social media. And I love the Napoleon, I think it was, which is his army was outnumbered. So he sent his men up on the hills around the opposition, and they lit bonfires at night. And the opposition went, oh my god, we're surrounded by this huge army. But actually, there were a few dozen people lighting fires. So if you can be everywhere, and you can obviously see I try really hard to do that, that um, then as investors, they keep hearing about you from friends. And by the time they've heard about you from the third reference friend, they go, of all this noise out there, the signals show that this is a winner. I'm in. So. And I think there's a, a really good point to expand on what you, on what you said, which is um, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people making at a really early stage is being way, way, way too precious about their data, their pitch deck, their idea, right? To your point, an idea is, is almost worthless, right? It's only about how you do it. And I see people who say, well, I'll send you this pitch deck, but you've got to sign an NDA. And no, nobody's going to sign an NDA to read your pitch deck, right? Um, you, you know, well, this idea this is completely proprietary. You could go off and do it. I guarantee you no VC has got any interest in going and doing anything executional whatsoever. There's no elbow grease going into that. Um, there is absolutely, you know, very, very, very infinitesimal chance that someone is going to take your pitch deck, go, that's a great idea, and rip it off. Right? It's far more likely that by being protective about it, you will put people off, you'll be seen as too difficult to deal with, and you won't get the investment that you want. So just spray and pray. <laughs> that's, that, that's our strategy at Angel Investment Network, we just spam. But have I revealed too much yet? <laughs> um, Will, I have a question for you as well, actually, which is, um, as the pressure of a startup founder while also fundraising at the same time, how do you run the two things in parallel? Because the thing I would stress to anybody is fundraising is a, is a hard job and to actually keep your business running. And like Anthony says, keep the data points going the right way. How do you manage that process? Uh, yeah, so I would say that seriously fundraising is pretty much a full-time job. Um, so you want to, as far as possible, contain it to set periods of time. It's very easy to be like continually fundraising. Um, ideally, you want to say, OK, I've got this three-month period that I'm going to fundraise, and I'm going to bank enough money for 12 months. I don't have to do it for another 12 months. Now, whether that's attainable or not, it may or may not be, but that should always kind of be your goal. Um, I would say, um, so A, kind of really strictly time boxing what you're, what you're doing on the investment side is important. The second thing is like the people that you're hiring, whether it's your co-founder or whether it's your engineers or whoever, um, bring them into the, uh, the process, bring them into knowing everything that's going on in the company and make sure that you're hiring people that you trust to get on and do things, right? If you are at the stage where Obviously, you need to be working on your company, but if you, if you can't delegate or if you can't trust people to get on with stuff when you're not there, um, then that's not going to be very helpful. For me, it's always been um, hiring like a really, really strong COO or a really, really strong technical lead who I trust to get on with the stuff that we've agreed. So if we've agreed something and we've got a one month or a six week or an eight week roadmap, I know that they're going to deliver that without me having to be kind of like constantly on top of it. And of course, you've got to keep checking in. And of course, you've got to keep um, on top of it. But the good thing is that there are, there are cadences to the day, right? So if you're making calls or if you're doing meetings all day, you've got evenings to check in on what you're doing. And you've you know, got that time period. If you're dealing with investors that are in a different time zone, you can manage your time that way. At the end of the day, it's, 
it's a, a raw brute force hours problem. But you can make life easier for you for yourself by having better, you know, by having te a team that you trust, a team that's involved in the process, um, and a team that can kind of have your back while you're out doing that. Um, and I think the other thing, just to, just to add to that, is things that you can do to keep yourself sane. Like I think one of the massively underrated things about starting any business, and particularly a business that you're fundraising for, is how like absolutely um, brutally tiring and sort of mentally exhausting it is. And so I think any entrepreneur going into that process, and this is going to sound a bit wishy-washy, but I think needs a really good kind of self-care regime, right? Whether it's making sure you have enough time for yourself to go to the gym, whether it's making sure you have enough time to see a therapist once a week, whether it's having enough time, to, like you've, you've got to make sure that you cut out enough time to actually keep yourself sane because there are points along this journey where you will go mental. <laughs> Just as an aside as well, something we see a problem with is we'll introduce investors to people. Um, 24 hours later, we just say to the entrepreneur, hey, did you get in touch with them? No, 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 I'm sorry, it was, we're firefighting customer service. And it's like, this is a difficult trade-off because this is somebody potentially putting 50,000 pounds into your business who really is top priority at that point in time over somebody who may have a niggle with your website. So I think you have to get adept at just dropping certain balls and you, you will drop them. Um, but so sometimes we get frustrated that people kind of go, oh, well, you know, the investor, I left him for two or three days. It's like, well, somebody else hasn't. Somebody else has been replying to him at midnight just for that period of time to make him, you know, again, first impressions. You only have to do that for a few days. So the initial perception of you is that you're somebody who's highly responsive and you now have a reason to have gone a little cold. Um, but I always think that's, that's pretty useful. Um, Liz, a question to you was, once you've got these investors, keeping them updated and then subsequently getting them to invest into future rounds, what is your process for them? Because it sounds like you've successfully fundraised several times. So, Yeah, I mean, I think um, from the beginning, we've always, well, when we, I would say that when we realized this, it really helped us. And I wish it was right at the beginning, but it was pretty close. As we started, we sort of treat our investors um, and both fundraising and as we, uh, and afterwards as a sales pipeline, right? So. We have the pipeline, we're going out and treating it in the same way that you wouldn't let a customer lead wait, so you're not gonna let an investor wait. And it, <coughs> then once they're in, it's like they're, they're your customers and, you're, and you have certain touch points that you say, these are our established touch points and this is how we treat our investors, this is how we treat our customers, this is how we inform them, this is the level of information that is important to them. And I think um, obviously how much you engage with them and what you do depends partially on like who's your lead and you treat them maybe differently than everyone else, but everyone who's put money into your business is an advocate for you. And they are as almost as invested as you in making sure that succeeds. So the more you engage them and the more you make them feel like they're along in the journey with you, um, I think the better they are at then in the next round, either reinvesting or if they aren't going to reinvest, saying, you know what, it's not right for me right now. And I think with SEIS investors, they're not always follow on investors, right? So our first angels, some followed on, but many didn't, but they would introduce us to someone else. And again, that's the most valuable introduction, right? And I think that you can't just imagine that someone's putting their money in you and, and walking away, right? And that you should keep them as engaged and as excited about your business as you, as you can. Can, can I hop in with one thing just about how frequently you do funding rounds? So in the past, when people went to lawyers, did all the documents, it was so slow and expensive that you would do that. You try and raise a lot of money in one go that would last you to the next go. And so you'd make promises to investors. You know, your goal is to get to the next circle each time, which might be three times the valuation to raise 3x the amount or something like that. And so after you've raised money, it takes you a while to use the money to build something to get new metrics. And that might be six months. And then it may take three to six months to find investors. And since you can't have no money in the bank, you have to allow at least three months on the end of that. So you may find a 12 to 18 month funding cycle. But it's immensely stressful. It's sort of every 18 months, go big or go bust. And, you know, the team, you're, inside, you're getting them excited. But on the flip side, you know that every, every month the cash is going down. And so one of my, the things I learned uh, from talking to customers on C-Legals is they kept telling me, I'm looking to raise 300K, but I've got like 200 lined up already. What should I do? Should I close a small round or should I wait? So we then came up with the rolling close, which we call instant investment. And now more than half of rounds done are uh, rolling close. So in other words, you close a small round and then you top up later. 
and we have a seed fast which lets you raise before a round in a sort of SEI version of a convertible note. So my goal is to transform actually these 12 to 18 month go big or go bust into more of a continuous fundraising. And I know, I know there's some of uh, people in the audience who periodically on a Sunday night will get another 50K or 30K or 10K or 5K or 10 times 5K. And I'm, I love how it's transforming the way people can raise investment. Brilliant. Um, Ollie, do we have any questions from the audience? Enough from me. Um, perfect. So these are questions, hopefully, that come from you that we can now get answered. So, Liz, how did your business stand out from all the other food businesses when you were pitching? How did our business stand out? Yeah, how did you make it stand out? Um, so we very much view ourselves as a food curation platform. And I think that in the world of overwhelming choice, being able to say, we are curating this for you. And we have solved a problem which is unique to a problem that anyone else is really trying to solve, especially here in the UK. And that was the biggest thing we needed to, have to hammer home, is that we aren't addressing the same problem as everyone else. We're saying, we believe that there's a curated solution and we believe we can get you the best food at lunch every day. And that specific thing is something that no one else in the market can do. And just being really clear about that. Um, this might be for Will. Um, my platform PIN is an MVP launch. We're seeking good early traction and I'm hoping to get good PR uptake. So just, do I seek investment now to fund quick growth or do I hold off, get some traction and then aim for a better deal? So what is the trade-off between creating hype <laughs> and fundraising? Um, I, I mean, to Anthony's point, you know, the hype is good because it, it's an amplifier of what you're doing, right? So if people see you around everywhere, it's, it's sort of, it is validation. I will say that I think it's hard. And if, you've got, if you're at the stage where you're at MVP and you're looking for kind of first investors, that money is going to be relatively close money. It's going to be friends and family money or angel investor money from people that you kind of know. So I would say, um, you know, hype, hype is not as valuable probably as actual traction. Um, therefore, focusing on that, I would say, is, is probably the right move to start with. Um, the sexy hype comes later. Um, I think a few of these have, have been answered. Um, for Liz, actually, how many investors did you have to pitch to in your first round before you got investment? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so I think we had about 15 investors actually come in our first round. And we probably pitched, so excluding sort of big pitches where you're pitching to a room full of, of people, because that also counts. but. Um, we probably individual pitch sessions did, I want to say, met close to 100 people. Yeah. And that's not necessarily like a pitch and saying this is the right person, but maybe it took you three steps to get to the right person. Um, and each, if you count each one of those as sort of, even if they're not going to invest, you have to go out and you have to sell your business until you get to the right person, then yeah, probably met 100 people. And, and Will, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, that number sounds about right. I think the it like like you know in investing prospecting like that is like any kind of sales process. You're going to have a percentage close. Um, I don't think I've ever topped much more than twenty percent of, of of pitches versus close. Um, Anton, this is probably one for you. So somebody said, as a non-technical founder with an idea, where should I look for technical support? So it is a big problem that a lot of people face of not having the technical skills themselves. Where can they find good technical co-founders or team? There has to be an Apple product opportunity there because that seems to be one of the hardest problems, which is you have an idea. And so, by the way, just to take a step back, I think there's sort of three roles that the founders need to cover. Thing number one is the domain expert. You know, you're a doctor, your sister's got diabetes, you've worked on some, whatever it is, you know, the solution and the, the, to a problem. The second role is the person who's going to deliver it, often the tech lead or the CTO. Um, and the product person who's going to turn the idea into reality. And the third role is the Mr. or Ms. Money, the CEO, CFO, the person who's going to get investors interested and make sure it's a viable business. And so when you look uh, at yourself, look within and see which one or more of these, and very rarely are you all three of them, more likely you are one and a half, and then you need to go and find someone to compliment. And when I look at a startup and I see one of these roles is 
definitely missing. You know, two Goldman Sachs ex-investors, you know, go to do a startup, great. They've got lots of money, they probably, but, but they have no idea how to build it, and there's a big gap. So, uh, but perhaps the biggest individual gap is finding the tech person, and there I can only recommend hang out at Tech Hub, you know, some events at Google Campus, Seed Camp, there's some uh, Facebook groups, um, maybe post that I'm now have looking for that, and actually one of my customers asked if I could post that they're looking for a tech lead, so I went, sure, whatever, and I posted, I got 130 responses from people from LinkedIn and Twitter going, you know, startup looking for tech co-founder, so I realized there's a huge untapped piece and a lot of people who want to be part of that. So if anyone has an idea, I think there's an opportunity. I will say there is a, um, if you Google, um, there is, a, I think either a meetup group or, or a different group, if you Google um, co-founder speed dating, there, I've seen quite a few events pop up here and in New York around just getting loads of people who have either got businesses or are technical co-founders, and, and there are all events organized that are basically speed dating, and it, I've, I've heard of people that have had quite good success doing that. You've actually nailed another question there. Um, I have to ask this just because, so somebody said, is it okay if the company I'm building isn't targeting scale or an exit? Isn't targeting what? Or scale an or an exit. Um, my suggestion would be that angel investors do, do invest in the hope that they'll get returns. I don't think they're there to fund people's lifestyle, but. Yeah, so I think they're kind of two types of companies. One of them is a, a company that makes money and it's great. You go to NatWest and you borrow some money and you give them 6% interest or whatever a year and that's the way you grow. But the rules of the game of equity is the investor is taking quite a high risk, reduced somewhat by SEIS and so on, but they're doing that for a high reward. And by the way, the whole SEIS and EIS tax deductions, HMRC, have a risk to capital requirements, so they want to see it's really going to be a growth business. So these businesses are sometimes called a lifestyle business, and sometimes you'll feel that a VC will tell you, it's, we love what you're doing, but it's a lifestyle business, which some people take very personally. It means you're just looking to grow a proper business that might be worth 10 million or 20 or maybe 30 million pounds, but not a unicorn. And so sometimes perversely, for the founders, you know, if I came home and told my wife, hey, I've sold the business for 50 million, she'll be delighted. But for uh, my investors have told me, unless it's worth, you know, 500 million, it's just not worth it for us. <laughs> so, so you have these mixed things, which is for a VC, they play it like a poker game. They know that only one in 30 needs to make a 100x multiple for them to be in business and many will fail. But for you, you're not interested in those odds. You actually want a much higher chance of a sustainable business. Well, it depends, right? You may have a mission to change the world, but for the most part. So I think there's nothing wrong with growing a sustainable business, but it may turn out that you have a hard time getting investors interested, or they want terms that reflect the modest growth. So they want interest, and they want their money back, and other things. And again, that's not sort of part of the game that is equity investment. Um, and a penultimate question for you, Will. Um, you exited before. When did you know it was the right time to exit for you as a decision? When we were almost running out of money. <laughs> um, no, uh, we didn't. Um, uh, it was purely opportunistic. So we went, so in my previous business, Channel Flip, we had raised a small angel round. We'd raised a friends and family round, then an angel round. And then we were looking at going out and doing a Series A round because we'd got enough traction to do that. And we went to all the usual VC firms that you would talk to. Um, but we also went to trade investors, so other companies that were in our sector that we thought would have a legitimate interest in taking a stake in our business and um, one of those investors, one of those potential people that we reached out to, which was News Corp, um, said actually we'd quite like to own this and we said well uh, what's it worth? <laughs> and they put a number down and we were like at that stage it was it was a, a, a life-changing per personally as a 20 something it was a life-changing amount of money and for our investors because we'd raised so little and actually we'd given away far more of the company than we should have done at a very early stage mm -hmm. um, they they all made 10x on what was like a relatively modest uh, relatively modest exit so I don't think you ever really know the right time it's only ever um, your own personal 
um, idea of sort of risk and reward. And I think that create, it creates an interesting um, incentive divergence, right? Because for, you know, as you said, for you, you know, 50 million pounds as an exit is like probably a large chunk of change in your pocket and you're very happy. To an investor, that's a complete failure. So I think you then end up getting into um, interesting ideas around how as a founder, if you're raising a large amount of money, can you take a little bit off the table to sort of help keep you going? Because if you're building a massive company value, you're sort of, in, you're sort of constantly, what's the word, sort of like log logarithmically <laughs> adding to your risk, right? The larger and larger and larger you get and it becomes more attractive to take money off the table. So I think then it's incumbent on investors to help you work out a way that you can, that you can uh, de-risk some of that. Uh, and last question to you, Anthony. Um, the end game is the exit. So as far as you see it, who are these buyers or how are these companies getting acquired in the, in the ones that you've had experience of founding and the ones you've seen? I think the, the, the beginnings of a company, there are many of them. The input to the funnel is very wide. And often, you know, the ideas are different, but the formula is, is not that different. I think the end of the funnel is much smaller. Um, in my own case, uh, one of them was to a very large brand that bought. Another one was a much smaller acquisition. Um, I, I think the goal, I should say, is not to plan for an exit, but plan to have a vibrant, growing business. Because if you think at the beginning your goal is to exit, you optimize for all the wrong things. You may optimize for massive growth at the expense of massive debt or a product that is fueled by social media influencers you paying and it's not sustainable. Whereas if you focus on growing a business, at some point the people who are interested in acquiring you will discover you and it will become apparent when you, know, you start ranking on Google SEO for a range of things and then news stories you know, the number of people you meet to go, oh, I've been tracking your company. It's like, whoa, um, that's interesting. So plan on a growing business. And I think opportunistically, at some point, you may have to push to accelerate that process. You really have to make a decision. Do I raise another round or do I sell or do I shut up shop? Um, well, at some point, it's sort of, well, the business has diverged a bit. I mean, one of my startups, it started, the audience started skewing younger and younger, which was great, and the metrics were great, but it wasn't really me. And when I got up and went, you know, what feature do we do next? I went, well, I, I don't really know. It's like my audience is like 18. I, so, uh, so um, and, and that was quite interesting. You know, you're chasing growth, but on the other hand, the, the, the reason you've built it in the first place, it's sort of, it's moved on. So there are all sorts of reasons, but again, just focus on growing a, a great business and the rest takes care of itself. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, um, it's, it could be really, if you focus on growing a, ba a great business, you'll be surprised where the acquisitions come from, right? My, one of my favorite stories of the last few years is lynda.com, if you, if you know that, which is a, uh, a, a married couple who started a business creating videos um, that were sort of uh, educational videos that they posted online. You had to pay a fee to watch these videos. You could upskill yourself on Photoshop or video editing or whatever. And they built this business step by step by step for 15, 16 years, like an incredibly long burn. And LinkedIn just decided one day they want to be in the education game as well as the social networking game and forked out one and a half billion dollars for it. And you go, when, they, when, that com when that couple started it literally around their kitchen table to produce educational videos to help upskill people, there was no way that they figured that in 15 years time, I don't think LinkedIn even existed at the time that they were building it, right? That LinkedIn would start, grow to be the biggest social network and then drop one and a half billion dollars to buy their company. But they built something valuable, so it will find you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope we were successful in our aims of, of teaching you something about taking it from idea to fundraising. And I'd just like to really thank the panel guests. I can't tell you how much good information is locked up in the heads that you've been able to hopefully profit from from people who've done it before. So if you could give them a round of applause, please. That'd be great. Um, and then last but not least, I'd suggest that you, you, you network with people here and hopefully you'll meet some good connections that you carry forward with your professional network for, for years to come. Thanks very much. Thank you.